Hi, everyone. Um, as Daniela said, I like running. I'm not really good at it, but I like it. There's just something about you know, setting goals for yourselves and pushing hard to achieve them. And if you are a millennial, there's probably even more to be said about broadcasting your successes to the world. You know, if you reach that goal, everyone should know. Fortunately, in this day and age, there's a device for that and there's an app for that. You can pretty much measure everything about yourself. You can use signals produced by yourself or by something around you to quantify things about you, to make things more convenient, to personalize things, to express your uniqueness. And chances are that trend is not going anywhere. If anything, new devices uh, recording and um, analyzing other signals from, uh, about us and from us are coming. And one such family of emerging technologies is something that I want to talk to you about today. Uh, devices attached to our brain. Specifically, I'm interested in non-invasive technologies, the examples of which already exist, uh, called brain-computer interfaces. It all started almost 20 years ago, and the purpose was very noble, actually. It started from the medical community, and the idea was to provide people uh, who were basically logged in with some way of communicating with the world. From that day, things have changed significantly, and nowadays, we, not, we don't only have uh, medical applications, we actually have a whole slew of entertainment, leisure applications uh, for brain-computer interfaces. A good example are these uh, cat-like ears, Nekomimi, which were actually the most wished for holiday present in Japan a couple years back. And the idea behind them is um, your neural signal, in this case, EEG signal, is being recorded. And based on your emotions, um, the ears wiggle. You know, if you're happy, ears wiggle. If you're sad, ears go down. So why am I talking about that today? You know, as it turns out, our electrophysiological signals are a little bit dangerous. Why? Because they contain quite a bit of information about us. And these devices, when they're sort of interacting and recording that uh, information, those signals about us, actually can lead to brain malware. Brain malware? Uh-oh, what's going on? It seems that she's going to make sense, and now uh, what is she doing? Yeah, every couple of years, people come and people start talking. Someone is uh, hacking our brain. Someone is poking our brain. The world is coming to, to an end. So what's going on? You know, I'm not one of those people, but what's going on here? Uh, in my talk today, I'm not poking or suggesting how we could poke someone's brain. I'm not delivering any current or anything like that. In fact, you could even argue that I'm not even suggesting how one could hack a brain. All I'm trying to show you today is that by just observing uh, our perfect brains and the way they regularly uh, function through the lens of these BCI devices and maybe other devices attached to our bodies, uh, other people could learn quite a bit about us. And not only that they could learn quite a bit of, uh, sensitive and private information about us, but it could be done in a way that we're not even aware of that. How? And how might that be? So first of all, let's narrow things down a little bit. What is brain spyware? I want to talk to you about that today. As the first uh, researchers who started thinking about it define it, it's any malicious uh, application that would, the purpose of which would be to extract private information about the user. How could that happen in the setting of BCIs? Well, there are two perspectives, maybe even more, but let's focus on the two. From an engineering perspective, and this is perfectly easy and straightforward. So from an engineering perspective, a brain-computer interface is just a communication system. You have those uh, electrical signals being recorded from your scalp. Those signals get digitized. You extract some features from them. You apply some sort of um, data analysis machine learning algorithm to make some inferences about those features. Based on them, you make some decision, and you deliver that decision to, to an app or to the external world, and some action is either made or not made based on that information, right? Now, what could go wrong? Well, 
uh, ideally nothing, but in reality quite a bit. Because of the infancy of this whole um, family of devices, everyone uh, can develop an app, BCI app, and not only than any, everyone can, but all of us are encouraged to do so by the manufacturers of these devices. And they will provide all the support you can imagine and more. That's not a problem, right? That's what we want, uh, how we want the world to work. The problem might be the fact that not only that you're developing any kind of app and there's no vetting of those apps whatsoever, but you actually get an access to the whole recorded uh, neural signal. Everything that is being recorded about your brain from your skull is delivered to uh, the app and the app developer. How might that be a problem? Well, if you combine that with a neuroscientific perspective, you kind of have a perfect storm, right? Uh, Neuroscientist will tell us that there exists this little something within our EEG signal known as uh, ERP or event related potential. And the gist of it is if we are presented with a stimulus, uh, our brains tend to react to those stimuli, unless your spine, you're trained not to do so. But even that is kind of hard. And uh, we react to different stimuli differently, but one of the important ones one for us in this case is P300. So what happens? If you are present, if I was to do something really unexpected right now, or if I did something that caused a strong emotional response in you, chances are that the majority of you would, if you were recording your EEG, would react with a positive peak on average 300 milliseconds after my stimulus. Okay, so how does that help us? Well, you know, the world is our oyster at this point, right? If we can come up with a nice stimulus, either visual or audio, and if we can present it to a user within the game, then, and then if later we have the whole uh, recorded signal to analyze in any way we want, we can do quite a bit. To test how much we can do, uh, we pushed it a little bit further. You know, we wanted to see what happens if we pull this out of the lab, so to speak. And we asked, uh, what happens if, you make, uh, if we make all of this subliminal? OK, so I talked about brain spiver, and I'm, now I'm talking about subliminal stuff. I'm on the roll today, right? Uh, as it turns out, the subliminal alarmists were right to some extent. What we don't see and what we don't know can, to some extent, hurt us. How? Well, uh, almost 20 years ago, it's been actually proven, and those uh, research and scientific results can be repeated and have been verified by uh, multiple people, that you, you can subliminally stimulate people. And what we mean by that is you can affect how people react both their uh, cognitive ability as well as their um, uh, motor actions based upon stimuli that uh, are happening be below their conscious level. And that has a measurable effect. You can see it in terms of time they need to execute certain tasks, in terms of actions that they uh, conduct, and many other things. There's a nice body of research now. OK, so uh, how do we achieve that subliminal stimulation? Well, generally speaking, there are two ways. You can either decrease the duration of the stimulus, or you can uh, decrease uh, the, the uh, you can decrease the duration, or you can make it hidden within other stuff. Right? What we decided to do is a little bit of both. And noticing anything unusual. Um, <laughs> let's try again. Before I freeze it on the screen, I showed it to you for seven milliseconds, and it was subliminal for most of you, but not for your brains. And this is what we used for our experimental study. We wanted to see how feasible uh, subliminal brain spiral actually would be. And to do so, um, we came up with this toy example, our flappy whale game. In Flappy Whale game, game, we're actually recording two types of electrical signals. Your signals from your skull, EEGs, and signals from your uh, 
arm muscle, EMG. EMG is used to control the position of the veil on the screen, and EEG is used to extract private information about you. And while you're playing the game, uh, we, made, we went through a lot of pain to actually get this approved. Uh, we are subliminally showing you different stimuli, but you have no idea that that is happening or when is it going to happen or what kind of stimuli. Because, you know, we tend to be good people and we really wasn't, were not trying to, you know, embarrass any, uh, our subjects, we stayed low key. So we presented sort of safe stimuli. Uh, coffee shops, financial institution logos, uh, sports leagues, uh, fast food chain logos, and things like that. We had different kind of games, and each of our subjects played a game, played different, uh, 10 different kind of games. In each game, we are showing just one type of stimuli, for example, sports leagues. There are five different stimuli. Each one is repeated uh, 10 times, and each one is presented on the screen for seven milliseconds. And then, based upon the recorded data, uh, well, when you first start, you get something looking like this. This is just the raw EG signal uh, synchronized with the presented stimuli. Doesn't seem like much, right? Just noise, and doesn't seem that it could be so terrifying in terms of our privacy, right? Well, uh, if you look a little bit deeper, and if you focus on each channel and on each window around the presented stimuli, then you get something looking more like this. And if you, uh, dive even deeper uh, and average out all the signals um, from one channel uh, corresponding to the same stimulus, you, you can actually clearly see that the person responded. You see that there's a, this positive peak. What does that tell us? That tells us that uh, there existed a logo that was significant for a person. And uh, how, do we, how did we confirm that? Uh, we did a whole bunch of data training and data testing. And then uh, we got experimental results, which we compared to the self-reported results that the user gave us after the whole uh, game thing was over. And what we're seeing is that in this subliminal setting, where we're trying to make it as realistic as you possibly can within a university and within a, within a lab, without any priming, without any idea what is going on, uh, you can actually go. Uh, and extract private information about users. Now, when we're talking about uh, coffee shops, that's probably an information you, you would never consider sensitive to begin with. But extend this idea a little bit further. Political preferences, uh, religious beliefs, prejudices, uh, medical condition, uh, other things you wouldn't want anyone to know, or other things you wouldn't want other people to use against you to persuade you to one thing or the other. Uh, okay, so what can we do about it? Now, let me back, back off a little bit. This was a toy example, and we could argue how uh, likely this risk is, how likely it is that this is going to happen in real life. You can even argue that people actually have to participate in some sense, indeed they have to put the EG uh, cap on. But um, the broader picture is many electrical signals from our body are being recorded, and we don't have to put the BCI cap on for that. But at this point, we are not really necessarily thinking about what else is hidden in that electrical signal that we're using for one specific purpose. And we are not thinking about potential uh, spillage of information that we might be willingly giving to whomever we're giving that signal. And I would like to uh, propose an, an approach where we're treating all of the electrophysiological signals the same way we are treating personally identifiable information or PIIs with our smart devices. And to put it simple, uh, mo in most cases, when we're using our electrical signals. We don't need the whole signal. We only need a specific component because we want, make, we want to make our apps fast and reliable and robust. So if we don't need the whole signal, why give the whole signal? It's easier from an engineering standpoint. It's not easy to build an algorithm that can sort of parse our electrical signal in real time, but it can be done. 
and we should probably do that from a security and privacy standpoint, it would make sense. Uh, now, brains can be hacked. Uh, our electrical signals might be giving more information about us than we were uh, initially aware. And we might be spilling information, sensitive things about us with, you know, in some subliminal way. Okay, what can we do? As with the regular system and as with the regular technology, we want to understand what is going on. We want to understand the CS side of things, the engineering side of things, but in many cases with these kind of apps, we will also have to understand the biomedical, bioengineering, neural engineering, life sciences side of things because the two things put together are what brings this threat. Then we want to understand threats. Obviously, uh, risk and risk will play a big deal here. Because these technologies are only emerging and fortunately nobody is poking our brain and reading our mind uh, today and the world is not gonna end when we exit this room, we are still at the position where we can develop uh, technical approaches to prevent some of those things from ever happening, such as my proposed BCI anonymizer. But the thing with the proposed BCI anonymizer is it's not a bulletproof solution. It's not going to be enough to say Okay, I put this good engineering practice in place. I developed this new thing for these new family of devices, so we're secure now, and there's no risk to our privacy. In many of these cases, from my experience playing with these emerging technologies, you actually have to put a non-technical uh, solution in place as well. What do I mean by that? I mean that you need to think about working with uh, legal scholars, social scientists, ethicists, and other people that we are now starting to think about including in the design process, but maybe a couple years back we were not really doing things that way, right? And only when all those things are put together, we actually have a chance of building these new technologies for, that are secure and privacy for, uh, preserving by design, which is what we would probably want to do. With this, um, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators and our uh, sponsors, and I would like to thank you for listening.